pilot study conducted by researchers from Shepherd University has been accepted for publication in the esteemed journal Photobiomodulation, Photomedicine, and Laser Surgery. Doctors Jennifer Flora and Kelly Watson Huffer co authored Transcranial Photobiomodulation Therapy as an Intervention for Opioid Cravings and Depression, a pilot cohort study which explores the potential of photobiomodulation therapy for opioid use disorder. I know you're impressed I got through all that, John, with all those multisyllabic words. This can surprise I, you sometimes. I, I was impressed you didn't have to breathe in between them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's welcome in the doctors, Flora and Huffer, to our program. Thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning. Thanks for having us. Uh, who would like to take the lead on this in explaining what it means that I just read? So I'll start. This is uh, Dr. Flora. Thank you, Dr. Jenny. Flora. Yeah, so our study centered around transcranial photobiomodulation, or TPBM. It's an innovative and non-invasive light therapy, and we used a special helmet that emits near-infrared light wavelengths, uh, which we believe can significantly help individuals suffering from opioid use disorder and depression. So specifically, the mechanism behind TPBM therapy involves the emission of that near-infrared light, and it penetrates the skull and stimulates brain cells, and the stimulation is thought to improve cellular energy production, uh, promoting better brain function and potentially rebalancing the brain's chemistry disrupted by opioid addiction. And additionally, the, the light can reduce inflammation, which other studies have shown, and aid in the healing of nerve cells, which is crucial for alleviating depressive symptoms often accompanying opioid addiction. So um, in reading the release, it says that the LED helmet emitting near-infrared light at 810 um, uh, wavelength. So does that mean, an 810 nm wavelength, does that mean that this specific wavelength is used for this particular treatment? And if you change the wavelength, it could treat other things as well? Or does that wavelength treat everything that you're doing in regards to... Uh, I think uh, PBM or red light therapy. So the the wavelength does matter, and the nanometer length. Well, it the, the nanometers, the number of nanometers. The the larger the number, the longer the wavelength. Uh, so we also at Shepherd University we have different devices that have different wavelengths. So if we were to use a shorter wavelength, we would not have been able to penetrate through the skull, um, through hair, through skull, so that length really does matter. And uh, Rob, I think I've shared this with you before the last time, by the way, thanks for having me back, sure. um, a database of all the studies that are being done around the world and the different wavelengths that they're using to treat various conditions, diseases, and disorders in the body. So yes, the wavelength does matter. Yes, I know we, we talked, uh, I think last year it was, and this red light therapy is used for many different things, including the possibility of regenerating hair growth for those who are follicularly challenged. <laughs> yes, but this is a much uh, uh, more serious uh, situation here because it's opioid use disorder in West Virginia is has been one of the worst states for uh, opioid use disorder. And the potential for with this treatment is what now in, in terms of uh, game-changing treatment for those who have this uh, opioid use disorder, Jenny or Kelly? I'll let uh, Kelly take this one. Um, well, you know, opioid use disorder treatment is multifaceted and uh, not everybody responds the same way to the same therapy, which is why we have multiple methods to treat um, opioid use disorder, including medication, including uh, therapy, group therapy, individual therapy. So this is one more tool in the toolbox that we uh, potentially could have available to people. At this point, it's not widely available. Uh, so studies like this help to bring awareness to what this technology can do for people. Uh, we did find there were no side effects. Um, which is consistent with other studies that have been completed using uh, red light therapy. And um, incidentally, we found that uh, the depression was a big impact factor for this as well, because not only did we treat the cravings, did we treat how frequently they had the craving, how intense the craving was, 
how long they crave the substance, but also that their depression scale scores improved. So we saw a measurable uh, improvement in depression, which is huge because we know that many people who have substance use disorder also have comorbid depression. How big was your sample study on this? We had 50 people enrolled. Um, we had 11 that dropped out for various reasons. So at the end, we had 39 participants that successfully completed the entire study. 22 were in a control group and 17 were in the uh, transcranial PBM group. So we had a pretty even number of people in the group. Mr. Gilstrap. So is, uh, good morning, uh, is opioid use disorder the same thing as what I would call addiction or is it a different thing? It is, it's just specific for opioids. Yeah, okay. addiction. Addiction encompasses many things. Um, you can be addicted to cigarettes. You can be addicted to okay. gambling, food, <laughs> exercise. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> never been my problem. I can tell you that. But <laughs> the food or the exercise? <laughs> Clarify, please. So, um, so when we think of someone who is has an opioid problem, uh, uh, coming off of the opioids, you have. Um, uh, they, they go into withdrawal. It's a systemic yes. issue. It's not just, it, it doesn't print to me as strictly a, uh, a brain disorder. It's not a matter of rewiring the brain. It's a total body disorder. Is that not the case? I mean, does this, does this uh, deep brain, not deep brain stimulation, photobiomodulation actually trick the, the liver and kidneys and the rest of the body into not needing the, the drug? Well, the primary thought for opioid use um, and cravings and addiction is on the mu receptors in the brain. And so with success um, with using this therapy in conjunction with other types of therapies, you are treating the whole body. So some of the medications we use to treat a substance use disorder help to detach the opioid from that mu receptor and then take up that space on the new receptor so that person doesn't experience craving. So this uh, technology helps to um, adjunct that and make that process work better. So is there, if, as this goes to phase five and phase 12, is there hope that then by choosing a different wavelength, we can treat different disorders, like eating disorders and that sort of thing? Oh, well, that's a very good question. Um, I think that, you know, that, that the world is open to that. Uh, this specific wavelength is what we needed to use to penetrate through the skull and get into the tissue that, you know, would respond best for um, opioid use disorder or substance use disorder. Um, not sure about the eating disorder, but, you know, if you're treating comorbid depression, if you're treating other issues that people often develop, other uh, mental health disorders that would and reason there might be an, an option that that would work. It also seems that as it goes forward, are we looking at a, a home treatment method? You, you take one of these helmets home, uh, again, going out a few years? Yes. So we actually just ordered our first set of headsets that are portable and can be taken home. Um, right now, they're they're a little bit expensive, and um, so we're, we are going to be launching a phase where we look at inpatient um, rehab centers uh, for treatment, and then potentially um, moving to an outpatient where those devices are checked out. But you know, with the funding possibilities out there, that is ideal um, to have these devices be taken home and to have some sort of, um, you know, accountability um, measure to make sure that people are participating in the treatment. Um, and, and now with, you know, telehealth, those platforms are out there where you, you could log on um, to do your treatment with uh, someone on the other side watching for, you know, at checking off your adherence. Uh, but those are absolutely things that we're looking for because that, that is the way of the world now. We need convenience um, in order for people to be compliant. Mr. Bodwell. Um, what you were talking about funding sources, what is the cost of one of these uh, headsets that could possibly be taken home? So 
right now, so they're about three thousand dollars for the general public. Um, since we're using them for research, we do get a discount. Uh, but as of right now, it, it's it's three thousand dollars for um, one that has frequencies and um, duo uh, wavelengths of light. Are they, um, doctor? Are they American made, or was this a technology that was developed in another country? Is it? Is this you know sort of is this is this process being worked on and being studied worldwide or just in America? This this is worldwide. Um, I, I I joke all the time that I'm, um, you know, I I'm working with all my partners around the world, um, which I am from here. I'm from Berkeley slash Jefferson County, you know, and I lived in Shepherdstown a very long time and we have one road. So the fact that we're reaching out all across the country to people in Australia and, uh, you know, we have uh, correspondents in India and all of these places, it's pretty amazing what they're doing. Um, Most of the people that we've partnered with are over in the UK uh, and the the headset specifically is from the UK, the one that we're getting. Um, And then we also have... um, some of the devices that we have are, are from Canada as well. I know you said that uh, you started with 50, 39 people completed uh, the program. How are they doing? What, are, what, were, what were their outcomes? You know, we, uh, so this study, we did not, it's not a um, longitudinal study, so we are not tracking their long term. Uh, so that is something that we would like to do in the future. So how are they doing one month post-treatment, six months post-treatment, a year post-treatment? So we do not have access to that information because, one, we didn't build it into our IRB proposal to have approval to track that. So that would be another phase. Uh, but I will say that in other uh, studies, longitudinal studies that are out there that are looking especially like at TBI, like traumatic brain injury, uh, and, and because this is trauma to the brain, um, drug addiction does cause trauma, especially to those dopaminergic um, receptors in the brain. Um, we're seeing that, you know, the farther out they are removed from having that light treatment, um, the symptoms are starting to come back. Um, now, addiction and and real trauma, like, uh, you know, several concussions, like CTE, like in football players, it's not, it's not comparing apples to apples, but it is something that we do need to look at for opioid use disorder. Um, how far removed is this something that needs to be part of you know, the way of living moving forward, because it is a natural process. It's not like a pill that's masking symptoms. Light is literally ungunking our cells to help our bodies heal the way that they were meant to um, and bring us back to a, a homeostatic, you know, situation where we we can rebuild and heal on our own. Well, let me ask this. The, the 39 that completed, I know you don't have long-term data, but short-term, how were they doing at the end of this at the end of this process? Were they better? Were they were they doing a lot better than they'd been at the beginning? Is mainly my question. Yes. Yeah, so oh, yeah. according to data, yes. Um, at the end of the study, the way our study was set up, we we measured had participants uh, fill out forms at, enrolling into the study, and we used the brief craving substance scale uh, form, which is a widely used way to quantify addiction cravings, um, and then we had them fill out the PQH9, which is similarly with depression. And, and I'm a practicing nurse practitioner. I've been that for 27 years. Uh, so I use the PHQ9 in my practice very often, <laughs> more time daily, uh, to help recognize the severity of depression that people are experiencing and help me make uh, clinical decisions to help with treatment. So we had them... M- complete these scales at the beginning of the study and then at the end of the study after eight weeks. Um, And our results were significant for the PBM group uh, in particular. Those participants had much less uh, severe cravings, much less frequency of cravings, and their depression scores improved tremendously, while the group that did not receive the PBM treatment did not have any significant change in any of those measures. Uh, 
Uh, now, it's important to know that the group that received the PBM therapy also received the same treatment therapies that the non-PBM group um, received as standard of care. Talking with Dr. Jenny Floor, Dr. Kelly watson Huffer. how many treatments completed the cycle? So all participants, uh, they did eight weeks of treatment, two times a week for three minutes a session. So the entire session only takes three minutes? Yes, for That's this device. For this device. Okay. So when, as you're doing this study, how do you figure out how often the treatments should be and what the duration of the treatment should be? We had, well, one, we used um, other studies. Um, to see what best practices were uh, and their outcomes. But we also had a consulting MD, and we have a good relationship with the engineer who created the devices, and based on their manufacturer proto protocols, uh, that's how we determined the appropriate wavelength and duration and number of sessions. For, forgive me for not knowing the specific technical terms for this, but if I'm using a, a radar gun to try to find out what the speed of a car is, I need to make sure that radar gun is calibrated and it's supposed to be calibrated every so often to make sure it's accurate. Are there similar guidelines in place for these helmets? Well, I, I, I would have to go back to uh, the engineer, uh, or the, so the manufacturer of the devices. Um, they handle that side of the house. Um, we're, we're the frontline workers, mm -hmm. uh, so, and that's why we, we keep them on our team. Um, th there is preventative maintenance that's done for those reasons to make sure that it's calibrated correctly, um, that the, the power that it's emitting is still on par with what it's you know, slated to provide. Um, so that would that would be what they are responsible for. And we are just responsible for making sure that they, you know, uphold that part of their duty. You were mentioning other parts of the world in which you've been in contact. Were, were uh, studies being done around the world similar to what you were doing simultaneous with what you were doing and that you were all consulting on information? The, uh, the studies, so there is, a, uh, a psychologist in uh, Massachusetts who actually completed three uh, opioid use um, disorder studies that we were pretty much expanding upon his research. Um, there, there are only four known studies currently in the world that are looking at uh, transcranial treatment for opioid use disorder, the ones that we have found. Um, and they only used, they did unilateral work, so they were looking at only treating one side of the brain. Uh, so ours is unique and groundbreaking because we did global, we did the full head. Uh, but not simultaneous, their studies were already complete, um, which kind of gave us um, a foundation to, uh, or a jump off point um, to follow in their footsteps. And what will be the local involvement here in Berkeley County, Jefferson County, in regards to your work and the ultimate end result of it? So the study we finished was in Jefferson County, and now Phase 2 is in a Berkeley County rehab center. So uh, we, we want to essentially duplicate those results um, to just show that this is truly a um, beneficial a supportive therapy that can be used and then to do to use those findings to start advocating for funding to get those devices within those rehab centers. How do you get from an experimental treatment to one that would actually be covered by insurance? What are the phases of climbing that ladder? Mm -hmm. That's a tough that's a tough answer. Um, you know, I've been involved with uh, PBM for several years and have actually been on Capitol Hill uh, lobbying for um, coverage. And, you know, it all starts with Medicare because in every other insurance on the planet follows what Medicare does. So, you know, getting Medicare on board is super important. Um, and that's a hard sell. It's a really hard sell. Uh, the equipment is expensive to purchase um, as far as, you know, putting it in the hands of, of everyday people. And if you're looking at treatments within a, like say, an office, a primary care office, um, you know, the reimbursement is not there. 
yet. But I know there are a lot of people uh, behind the scenes who are working very hard to continue to lobby for this. And hopefully, you know, one day it will happen. About two minutes left. Comment, uh, John? In, in, yeah, John? in a study like this, how do you how do you account for just good old-fashioned willpower? It would seem to me that somebody who participates in a study like this is very strongly motivated to overcome their their addiction or their, their yeah. disorder. Not everybody's going to be there, or it could be situational. Six months, a year from now, perhaps that, that driving will disappears. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, you know, everybody is different. I, I've worked with people with addictions for many years, and I, one of the things I can tell you about 99.9% .9 of them is they don't want to be there. They really don't want to be there. But the, the grip that substance use disorder has on the brain and those cravings, uh, someone once told me when I asked, why, you've overdosed four times, why do you keep going back? And that person told me that it was akin to someone holding your head underwater and all you were trying to do is get up to get air. That craving is so strong that that's all they, they think about. And so offering them something else in the toolbox that can help to reduce those cravings is a godsend because most people don't want to be in addiction at all. They, would, they know what that does to their life and it's, not a, it, it's a choice initially and then after that it's not a choice anymore. You're in the grip. Doctors Flora and Huffer, thank you so much for your time this morning. Very much appreciated. Best of luck to you on this moving forward. Thank you. Thank you.